Welcome everyone to a day in the life of a luxury agent. I'm coach Greg Holthouse and I'm super excited to bring to you our next guest. Rochelle Le Cavalier represents some of the most impressive properties and developments in Florida, most recently as the vice president of sales at the residences at Mandarin Oriental, Boca Raton. Today she serves as the executive director of luxury sales, as well as the director of the sports and entertainment division for Douglas Element in Florida. Rochelle is also known for her grasp on global luxury while maintaining a hyper-local focus on the Boca Raton luxury real estate market. As a speaker, her show brings audiences on a journey of self-discovery and delivers immediate, tangible value to her audiences. You may recognize Rochelle from her very attractive social media presence as Rochelle.tv and her YouTube series, Tuesday Tours, now in its second season. With over 100 million in sales, Rochelle has achieved a foundation of credibility that she is consistently expanding on. She's always looking at bringing more value to her clients as the pathway to growth and expansion. Today, Rochelle will be sharing with us a behind the scenes look at a day in the life of a luxury agent. Rochelle, take it away. Thank you, Greg. So hello and welcome to a day in the life of a luxury agent. I'm Rochelle Le Cavalier, and I am delighted to have this opportunity to be with you today for Tom Ferry's Success Summit 2020. Honestly, I'm humbled to be included in this lineup of amazing keynote speakers, including the king of keeping it real, Mr. Gary Vaynerchuk. I wanna thank you, Gary, for being you and all you've contributed to me and my business over the years. So in this platform, you're gonna see a chat window that I'm told will remain open during and after this talk. You can connect with me here or on social. I'm at Rochelle.tv, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, smoke signals. Um, and I promise if you send me a message, I'll absolutely reply. Also, I'm not going to be clicking through PowerPoint slides today. I'm just going to talk to you. But the slide deck, it's going to be like a PowerPoint into a PDF with all the talking points is going to be um, connected to this talk in the platform. You can have all my talking points and all of the resources that I mentioned will be there. So if you attended Summit in 2018, you might remember me and my backstory. I moved to Boca Raton in 2011, not knowing a single solitary soul. And in a span of a few years, I went from selling $20,000 condominiums <clears throat> in a neighboring county to 10xing my average sales price by targeting and breaking into an ultra exclusive, impossible to penetrate luxury market. There are some milestones I've reached and some goals I've accomplished, and I'll tell you about some of those in this talk. But perhaps more importantly, there are some areas where I've fallen short, like really, really short. And I'll share those too. Hopefully, you'll come away with something today that elevates you to the next rung in the ladder that is your real estate journey. So today, I'm here specifically to share a behind-the-scenes breakdown of the habits, the schedule, and the behaviors of highly successful top luxury agents. Let's be clear, okay? This is about modeling. You can quantum leap your results in any area of your life by studying the habits and rituals of people who have already accomplished what you're aiming to do. So in this talk, I'm gonna share with you how I finally, finally, I got on track to earn $1 million in GCI for the very first time after having this as my goal for the past three years and never quite getting there. You'll hear about the daily activities that when executed consistently made that $1 million in GCI a predictable outcome, not just a goal or an aspiration, some high in the sky, oh, if only, but I have to keep it real. That's very much how it started out. You're also gonna hear how I lost $300,000 still hurts to say it, $300,000 in GCI when I allowed myself to get distracted and not follow those same daily activities that I'm going to share. That commission would have put me over the goal at the halfway point of the year, by the way. Oh, and this is 2020, not like ages ago. So am I the end all be all? No, I am very much on this journey with you. You may be ahead of me or behind me in various areas of your growth and development, but when we keep it real about who we are and where we are, a whole new world of possibility unfolds. So today we're going to discuss modeling. 
defining your ideal business and life. We'll discuss what not to do ever. That's the one pitfall that will derail even very successful luxury agents in a flash. We'll discuss what to do every single day. The non-negotiable daily activities of the most successful luxury agents, daily and weekly action checklists proven to quantum leap your business, and the ultimate day, how to create and follow an hour-by-hour -hour schedule with time blocking. So, what does a luxury agent look like? Well, let's start with perception versus reality. When you think about a luxury agent, comes to your mind. I'll play a clip. So many people think of a luxury agent and they see these Instagram worthy mansions, photo shoots, parties, public speaking, being in the media, television shows like million dollar listing and all that glamour. And there's absolutely an element of that. Clearly, I was able to dig up at least a little footage. But to buy into the glamorous side of business being at the root of the success for a luxury agent is an error in cause and effect logic. Let me show you another clip. <laughs> Okay, so this was me with my phone last week when I had this brilliant idea to capture a little day in the life realness and share it with all of you. But where did I get the idea to get up before sunrise and be on a daily 5 a.m. call? To carve out time to exercise every single day? To meditate? Talk on the phone while getting dressed? Listen to audiobooks at 1.5 speed? Track and measure my daily activities? Put butter in my coffee? How about work at a standing desk and making prospect calls at exactly 9 a.m. each day? And preface, preface those hard questions with, I'm just curious. Thank you, Bill Pipes. None of these were my original ideas. And it has been said that there were absolutely no new ideas. So what if that were true? Newsflash, you are already modeling someone. If you think you aren't, then you're simply not aware of whom you're modeling. Think about it. How did you learn to speak, walk, write? It's all modeling. And when you're aware that you're modeling, you can at least be conscious and selective about it. And there is some real magic available to you. So let's talk about modeling successful agents. While modeling successful agents will give you a quantum leap, you must first determine what kind of business you want and how you wish to define success. There are myriad ways to have a successful business, and no matter how you define success, I subscribe to the a la carte approach to designing my ideal business model. So what does success mean to you? Is it money, health, freedom, fame, power, prestige, quality of life? Well, if you're like most people, it's some mix of these things. When I first moved to Boca Raton nearly 10 years ago, I had the privilege to meet a very successful agent, one at the very top in my marketplace. And he was and is really generous with sharing experience and advice. 
His model was inch-wide mile deep and his farm, eight oceanfront luxury condominium buildings. That's it. He was and is the number one condo agent in our market and he probably will continue to be until he dies. In South Florida, there's a team that prides itself on servicing luxury homes from Jupiter to Brickell. This is the equivalent of working Malibu to Dana Point or Montauk to Manhattan. It's about a hundred mile area tip to tip. They've sold just shy of $200 million in volume for the last few years. Meanwhile, there's a single agent also in my market who's a broker owner and he's sold about the same volume for the same years serving a single community of fewer than 1,000 homes. Last year, there was one agent who sold over $570 million in volume working just Palm Beach Island. So I studied these agents and others carefully figuring out, okay, what aspects of their business do I admire? And what other parts do I want nothing to do with? As I mentioned, a la carte. For me, the inch wide mile deep approach, it just made sense. When you know every house, every sale, every street, all the nooks and crannies, you can bring the competitive advantage that very few will have. As I shared in my 2018 talk on breaking into the Royal Palm Yacht and Country Club market, I gained some traction and then I moved into the neighborhood, focusing my energies on luxury properties in Boca Raton exclusively. In my mind, there was nothing more appealing than living, working, and playing among the elite, serving people I respected, and enjoying an exceptional lifestyle. Once the model is clearly outlined, it is simple and straightforward to design your non-negotiable daily activities, modeling those who have walked the same path before you. Your daily action checklist will probably fit on a post-it. So voila, 200 million in volume coming right up, right? <laughs> no, that brings us to the one pitfall. So let's go back to my talk at Tom X in 2018, where I told my story of defying all odds, going from selling $20,000 condos to multi-million dollar luxury homes within a few short years. That hustle was real, okay? I doubled my average sales price and volume every year for five years. Then I fell flat. Well, flat on my face might be more accurate. I had hit a high of $30 million in sales and the next year sold just 17 million. And I'm here to tell you how and why so that on your road to victory as a luxury agent, you can perhaps skip the dip. So what happened? Well, last year I worked part-time and totally not in the way you're thinking, not in some good way. It wasn't like golf, lunches out, self-care, lots of free time to enjoy the day away in the sun. Honestly, I probably would have done more business if that's what I was doing. What I mean is that I worked only part-time on the non-negotiable daily activities that had paved the way for me to even accomplish what I had. So after making a bit of a name for myself locally, I was approached about a very prestigious role working with the new development division of Douglas Element. For a year, I served as the vice president of sales for the residences at Mandarin Oriental Boca Raton. This was and is the most exclusive luxury project in my market with a sellout of over $400 million. What I was most excited about though was the prestige of it. I was hosting cocktail party receptions, giving presentations to investors, speaking on panels. I traveled to New York, Boston, Greenwich, and I presented on branded luxury development as an expert. I even flew with Mandarin Oriental ex executives and the developer to meet with the architectural and design teams to dissect the building design. Talk about luxury. What I didn't see coming were the meetings. Oh, so many meetings and the paperwork, the conference calls, and the management of people and details I did not enjoy managing. Well, this was not the model I designed. The one I had employed to double my volume and average price point every year, I figured I could pull off a hybrid. There were people who had, after all. I could think of three, nationally. Unfortunately, I didn't reevaluate my model and scrutinize my daily action. In short, I got distracted. Distraction comes in many forms, and I assert this is the one pitfall that will take you out faster than any other, especially if you're a top-producing luxury agent. 
Why? Well, once you've established some level of success and visibility, there will be more people than ever who will DM you, invite you to lunch, ask you to participate in professional organizations. Maybe sit on a committee, they'll ask to be on your team, they'll ask you to mentor them, they'll request you be on a panel or be on a TV show, or present you with an exciting business opportunity, uh, like running a $400 million brand luxury development. Now, these can all be good things, but you can't say yes to every invitation and continue to be focused on your non-negotiable daily activities with no shift. I said yes to what looked like a dream opportunity and did not adjust my model. So certain daily actions, they simply didn't happen. Thankfully, with the help of my coach, I realized what I had done and I've successfully renegotiated the opportunity with the residences at Mandarin Oriental. And today, I'm in a role that's in line with my business model, and it's infinitely sustainable. P.S., my new role pays me more money for less time invested, and I'm only, only doing the work that I love doing and I find most rewarding. So, in my introduction, I told you that I would share the story of how I lost $300,000 to distraction. I'll invite you to listen and use my pain for your gain. Okay, during the reposition period I just shared, I was getting back into the habit of making my daily calls and I discovered a buyer I'd been working with off and on for about six months. And I hadn't spoken with them in about six weeks. So I brazenly picked up where I left off, sending them what I believed would be the perfect home based on their criteria. When we finally connected a day or so later, the buyer told me she loved the house I'd sent, but unfortunately had gone into contract on a pocket listing and would be closing in a few days. Now, for anyone who knows me in my marketplace, you know I am all about the pocket listing. I mean, I have a full pocket at all times, and that's precisely how I managed to break into this luxury market. I used to review my pocket inventory every morning, and I suddenly realized that I hadn't looked at that list in months. I said to her, okay, I'm just curious, where's the house? Long story short, she gave me the address of a house that I, and apparently at least one other agent, had been holding as a pocket listing for over a year. The home I'd sent her days before had come on the market a full two weeks before she and I had last spoken, and I had failed to notice it. That house ticked all the boxes. Have you ever heard of shiny object syndrome? Well, as a luxury agent, you can become a shiny object. It's wonderful to be invited to participate in a host of activities and offer new and exciting opportunities, but allowing distraction is the single fastest way to derail for a luxury agent. So let's talk about non-negotiable daily activities. The luxury segment is the pinnacle of real estate sales with top producers earning millions of dollars per year and bringing serious value to a clientele that's generally highly educated and financially savvy, seeking out a very specific niche specialist to assist them to buy or sell a multi-million dollar asset. This is a demographic that values time, efficiency, discretion, and expertise. Welcome to the big league. To excel as a top luxury agent, you must be ready, willing, and able to perform at all times. It is with this single objective in mind that I offer you my list of the five non-negotiable daily activities required to make it in this segment. For any real estate agent, there are key things that have to happen absolutely every day to build and maintain a successful business. The luxury market is distinct from other real estate segments in many ways, but they're more alike than different. I'll highlight some of these differences as we make our way through the five activities, which just for fun, I'm going to call the five to thrive. Okay, let's dive into the five to thrive, your daily activities. You must be ready, willing, and able to perform at the top of your game at all times. And these five actions will ensure that you are set up to win. Number one, you have to take care of yourself. If you're not personally in good condition, you're not going to be in a position to excel. Simple as that. Let's talk about exercise, nutrition, and sleep. For your body to function optimally, including your very important thinking organ, your brain, you're going to have to look after these things. Nutrition is important in service of your overall health, and there are many ways to approach nutrition, 
I'm not even going to go there, okay? But here's what I will offer as a non-negotiable. Figure out what works for you and your body and do that every day. And make it easy. If it's a hassle, you'll just slip up. Personally, I order from a meal service and I don't debate my food choices. I follow the plan, the food shows up, and I eat it. For me, exercise also became easier when I made it a daily discipline. Before this, I would schedule a certain number of mornings per week that I would exercise knowing I would miss some. And that led to missing some and then missing many and then getting completely out of the routine only to have to start over again on some random Monday and do the whole thing again and again. Now, full disclosure, this was not my original idea. I didn't think exercise was fun, okay? I dreaded it, but I knew it was important. So I watched what other high functioning people were doing and I tried various solutions until this one just clicked for me. I no longer think about exercise. I don't have an opinion about it. I don't debate whether I will or I won't execute on my exercise plan. It's just my routine. Matthew McConaughey famously has said that his workout regimen is to break one sweat every day. And he rarely works out in the gym. Have you seen Matthew McConaughey? Daily. Many successful people credit daily exercise with aiding in sleep, increased energy, and clearing the brain of noise with clear thoughts and great ideas as a byproduct. It's hard to overstate how critical sleep is to your health and well-being, but many people just don't get the rest that they need. And I'm here to tell you that I used to take pride in sleeping very little and powering through even when I was exhausted. I had terrible sleeping habits for most of my life, working late, drinking at events in the evening, then getting up really early and pounding caffeine to compensate. I was edgy and impatient, and until I began sleeping properly, I had no idea how foggy my brain actually was during all those years. I now understand that sleep is the most important factor in our health and well-being. It's even before diet and exercise. People think they can cheat on sleep. Even if you're eating well and exercising, a lack of sleep will eventually catch up with you and negate all the positive choices you made during the day. Again, this was not my idea either. When one of my clients, a professional hockey player at the top of his game and the captain of his team, told me he slept 12 hours per day, by the way, he's in his 20s, and that it's really common among his peers, I looked into it and began to study up on the role of sleep in recovery. For proper sleep, it's all in your routine. Get up at the same time each day, and this is far easier when you go to bed around the same time and allow enough time for pre-bedtime routine plus the sleep you need before that alarm goes off. Experts say you should optimize your sleeping environment, and I have found it works wonders. Which brings us to the morning routine. Now, The Miracle Morning by Hal Elrod, Hal Elrod is a book that changed my life. I love books, and I read a lot of them. On average, I read a book a week, and I don't read fiction. And I can't say this about very many books. So if you haven't read it yet, I highly recommend that you do. This book, which outlines creating a morning routine, opened my eyes to the importance of how I start my day. Elrod walks the reader through his own experience in his morning routine based on his six-step life savers, S-A-V-E-R-S, which is silence, affirmation, visualization, exercise, reading, and scribing. I've practiced my morning routine with very little variation for over a year. I started with Elrod's routine, and I've evolved it to suit me. Every tweak I make is intentional and well thought out. Beginning my day with a foundation of what I know works to set up my day to win has made a colossal difference in how I approach my work. I found that I'm more focused, even-tempered, patient, efficient, and clear-headed than I ever thought was possible. So if you're curious, my morning routine goes something like this. I'm on a 5 a.m. call, I journal, I read, I do my meditation affirmations, I break a sweat, I watch the sunrise, I do an ice meditation, I do yoga and sun salutations. All right, the final piece about taking care of yourself is personal maintenance and upkeep. To be related to as a legitimate luxury agent, you should really look like the other professionals your clients go to for advice. Think about it. At a million dollars a year, your hourly rate is about $500 on average. Your time with clients is the highest revenue producing time you have. So let's call that $1,000 hour work. Who else earns $1,000 an hour? 
Well, maybe their attorney, their financial planner, their business manager, etc. As a top luxury agent, these should be your peers. If you don't look like them, you might be categorized in another way. I practice a certain amount of personal maintenance as part of my routine, and it's all in my schedule. My car is washed at my house on Saturday, dry cleaner picks up and delivers, my cosmetic upkeep, upkeep right, facials, hair, and nails, it's all scheduled in advance. I have pressed clothing hanging and ready, shoes are shined, etc. All right, your daily activity number two is to hand off that low dollar work. So what is low dollar work? Well, let's go back to you earn a million dollars a year. That breaks down to about $500 per hour. By focusing on your highest revenue producing activities and the things only you can do, your income will increase dramatically year over year. Ask yourself, can I pay someone else to do this, especially if you don't like doing it? If the answer is yes, consider it. Important note, once you hand off that low dollar work, you should then be doing high value revenue producing activities instead. Top producing agents across all market segments should be doing the same thing. Identify the activities that they can pay someone else to do as they perform those tasks that only they can effectively do. For a foreclosure specialist, low dollar work means one thing and for a luxury agent, it really is another. One example that comes to mind for me is ISAs. For top producing teams nationwide, this role is key to the equation, and there's no way a team leader would be making lead nurturing calls. In my case, I can tell you that the fact that I personally am calling and personally answering my phone goes a long way with my clientele. So lead nurturing may be low dollar work within one market segment, though not in this one. It is important to note that low dollar work does not mean entry level. On my team, our transaction coordinator is more seasoned than most of the paralegals we work with. She has a deep understanding of the process and can explain caveats of a transaction to everyone involved and navigate the process with minimal involvement from me, saving me hours on every deal. In the luxury segment, there's an expectation of a higher level of service overall. There are several add-on services that my team will perform on behalf of the client that may or may not be really directly related to the transaction. And these are all low dollar activities. As a top luxury agent, you'll need the infrastructure to deliver on these expectations. Daily activity number three, do the work only you can do, connecting. Now, this is real estate 101. Make your prospecting calls and go on appointments. In the luxury segment, the demographic tends to be high touch and have expectations of service and responsiveness on par with their attorney, financial institutions, private banking establishments. All of these generally have an immediately available live human being available during business hours and probably by email and mobile after hours. With this level of expectation, you must be highly responsive. Once I began to track and measure my calls and appointments, I realized I didn't need to make hundreds of calls to accomplish the mission. I discovered that when I speak with five people per day, schedule one appointment, it all goes to plan. I also discovered that my calls tend to be longer than average and go quite deep into specifics that I am uniquely qualified to address. In addition to calling prospects, the role of staying in touch with the SOI, sphere of influence, for a luxury agent cannot be overstated. This demographic prefers to do business with people they know, like, and trust, people they estimate to be like them. A close second is someone who's recommended by a trusted friend or advisor. One thing that I discovered is that for the demographic that buys and sells multi-million dollar property, everything is optional with very little exception. They do not have to buy that fourth home and they do not have to sell the house they aren't living in anymore. When everything is optional, there is limited external motivation. This makes the job of connecting with the client or prospect on an emotional level key to accomplishing, well, anything. This is the job to be done. Connect as deeply as possible. I've made deep connection with clients over the years, and many of them have become very dear friends as a result because I genuinely care about them. You may have heard about the Ford questions. Ask about family, occupation, recreation, and their dreams to open up genuine and authentic dialogue. I manage all my interactions in a database, and my daily tasks include a combination of handwritten notes, phone calls, social media DMs, texts, popovers, lunch. It's sprinkled with some automated touches as well. 
And when I have a conversation with someone, I carefully note what they've shared with me. When we next speak, I can usually recall most of the conversation in great detail, and I've offered a more tailored experience with only their objectives in mind. I'll tell you, the absolute weakest phone call you can make is, hi, I'm just calling to check in. Don't do that. Be personally connected instead. Don't be a salesman. Be a resource. I have a hot list and I have a warm list. Ideally, I review both of those daily. I don't really use, lose any opportunities when I'm on top of my list. The buyer I mentioned in the last section, in the one pitfall, that family was on my warm list. Now, they happen to now be on my nurture list, and I've promised myself when they're ready to move again, I'll be the one serving them. Most of my touch model comes from the book Ninja Selling by Larry Kendall. If you haven't heard of it, absolutely worth checking that book out. Number four on your daily action checklist. Be visible to see and be seen. As a real estate agent, perhaps your top objective is being top of mind. There are many ways we can accomplish this. Print advertising, direct mail, social media, maybe you even have a billboard or a radio commercial. The demographic that sells multi-million dollar homes can be a little harder to reach. That glossy magazine may be one of a dozen they received this week. They may not even check their own mail. Social media use is high in this demographic, but it's not usually how they're selecting professionals. So, how do you crack this nut? Well, advertising touches do remain important. They just aren't enough. Think of advertising as the first layer of touches. You know, it's the least personal, the least effective, but it's a good foundation to at least demonstrate who you are and what you do. For most successful luxury agents, becoming a social acquaintance is really the key to moving beyond being the one who they've seen in the ads. When your children attend the same school, you're a member of the same country club, you're active in charities together, serve on boards, you see one another at events, fundraisers, parties, maybe you're on the golf course or the tennis court, then you're off to a good start. You're in their world. One challenge I personally face is being too busy to go anywhere. It's happened several times that I show up for Ladies Day at my country club only for my fellow golfers to ask if I've been away for the summer. Kiss of death. In addition to being visible in the right circumstances and crowds, it's also a great opportunity to actually establish being a human being with your target audience. Establish that rapport with them using the four questions, F-O-R-D. Now, I tend to overwork when I'm stressed out, which that's never productive. And I have found that if I can go out and be among other humans doing something I enjoy, good things start to happen. This is the, really the top of the visibility pyramid, being personally connected. Face-to-face -face contact is the most powerful, and an advertisement is the weakest. Think of it like layers. And number five on your daily action checklist is know your market cold. Top producing agents make a study of their market and they know the inventory, what's recently sold, what hasn't sold, and why not? What's the average price per square foot in various segments? In my market, the cost of land and the cost of construction also comes into conversation. Anyone in this demographic who asks you a question about this either already knows the answer or they at least have a theory, okay? This person will be looking for you for an immediate and accurate response. I'll get back to you. It's not really going to fly. So how do you stay up to date on your market? Well, you make a daily study of it. One thing I've come to appreciate in the past few, few years is my relationships with other brokers in my market. I regularly speak with other agents about their take on the market in addition to making a daily study of my hot sheets, market stats, and inventory. Remember, in the luxury segment, this demographic tends to be high touch, and they have high expectations of service and responsiveness on par with their attorney, financial institution, and bankers. With this level of expectation, you must be highly responsive and highly competent. There are not people in this demographic who will generally just step over not being super clear about the details. There are very few agents who make it to the pinnacle of real estate success mastering the luxury market. This is the big leagues, and if it, does, it doesn't come without mastering your daily disciplines and making a study of your craft. And that brings me to our weekly action checklist. Number one on my weekly action checklist is, you won't believe it, do something fun. So in the last section, we discussed being visible 
and being seen by your target demographic. If you look at the most successful luxury agents in the country, and I'm friends with many of them, you'll see them out in public living a very social life. You may not need this one on your weekly checklist, but I sure do. Contrary to what you might gather from my social media feed, my natural inclination is to be a bit of a hermit and to overwork, especially when I'm stressed. I quickly justify canceling golf or meetings up socially, and I just forget about being out in public and mixing with my sphere. And then I forget that's the key to my success as a luxury agent. With it number one on my list, I look at my weekly schedule when I plan, and I make time for this very important aspect of connecting with my people. Once I've made a commitment to be somewhere, I end up going and I have a great time. Number two on my weekly action checklist is my listings review. In my market, luxury property doesn't sell with the same velocity as our median price point. It's not uncommon for a property in this segment to take a year or more to sell. And as a result, many agents become complacent and they just make no discernible effort whatsoever. So I make it a point to review every listing I have every week in detail as if it were a new listing opportunity. What's the price it should sell for? And who's my ideal buyer? And how do we reach that buyer? Then I take a deep dive into my database and ask myself the question, if I had to sell this house today, how would I do it? Who would I call? And then I look for the buyer on my hot and warm list and call other agents who might have the buyer on their list. Number three on my weekly action checklist is to talk to every active client personally. At some point, I began to see that the best way to stay in excellent communication with my clients is to offer over communication and show them everything we're doing to deliver the result. A lot of what we do is behind the scenes. And unless we tell the client what we're doing, there's no way they would really know. I'll start with my listing updates. I personally call and email all of my sellers every week with an update. After I've completed that listings review I just described in the last section, I'm completely clear on the market activity over the past week, the direction the market's heading, and I have a game plan of what actions I'm going to be taking to get the property sold. My sellers appreciate being kept in the loop, and most of the time, when it's time for a price reduction, it's their idea. When this has fallen out in the past, it's always been a recipe for unmet expectations and total seller disappointment. My active buyer updates. I personally call and email each of my buyers every week with a conversation about their thoughts on our mission. In this call, I do a lot of listening as we review the properties we've seen and what we're looking for and the status of the inventory on and off market. In many cases, the buyer needs to percolate as we see homes and evaluate the opportunities. Bearing in mind that in this segment, everything is optional. So the objective is to get in touch with their emotional motivations. Number four on our weekly action list is the business plan review. Track your KPIs. Peter Drucker is often quoted as saying, you can't manage what you can't measure. Drucker means that you can't know whether or not you're successful unless success is defined and tracked. In absence of track measuring, you could sell a home a week and say, you're a champion and you're winning, or that you're failing philosophy and you're a total loser. I have a clear plan for each week and I review my KPIs, that's key performance indicators, to tell me whether I'm on track or not. This saves me from buying into my own hype and feeling productive when all I've been is busy like a hamster on a wheel. When I meet my KPIs, the results are there in black and white, and I have a basis for claiming victory or defeat. And more importantly, I can get to work on uncovering what was present or missing that resulted in the outcome, and then I can make refinements. The budget review. It's been said that it's not what you make, but what you keep that's important. If you've been in real estate long enough, you've certainly heard of agents who make more money than they ever imagined and somehow end up in crippling debt. Reserving for taxes and reinvesting in the business aren't just good ideas, they're requirements if you plan to go the distance as an agent in this segment. To properly market a luxury property, there's a significant investment that must be made in advance of that property ever hitting the market. Because we take everything on contingency as listing agents, cash reserves are not a luxury, they are a necessity. I have to tell you this story. There was a cast member from Million Dollar Listing LA who came to Boca Raton to have kind of a look around and understand our market a little bit. And he said, I have no idea how you even make a living here. <laughs> I laughed, we do okay. 
But the Boca Raton luxury market tops out at about $20 million. And my average selling price is just under $3 million. So I have to budget accordingly. This isn't LA. I found that it's very easy to take my eye off the ball when it comes to budget review and tracking. It's not my favorite aspect of the business to track and measure. I think it's boring, but I know it's important, so it's on my weekly checklist. And my marketing plan review. While marketing is one of my very favorite aspects of the business, I have a predisposition to the shiny object syndrome, and I have to manage myself really carefully as it relates to marketing. I used to get so excited about the next brilliant idea that I would sometimes forget to make sure the already planned and statistically effective direct mail pieces would go out. In fact, last summer, I forgot to send out direct mail piece for the plan, and then I deferred it for several weeks when my agent, uh, when my assistant called me out on it. I was looking at other things. So to remedy this, I hired a marketing manager to execute on our marketing plan, which we call the marketing Parthenon. Thanks, Tom Perry. And I removed myself from the day-to-day -day of marketing. It turned out that this is one of those areas that I could pay someone to do a better job than I would do and free myself up to work on those direct revenue producing activities. Now I review the marketing plan, which includes a marketing budget, to be sure we're following the plan and tracking and measuring the results carefully. I know where every sale I've made for the past five years came from. And by analyzing the most effective lead sources each year, I've carefully allocated more budget toward those things I know are effective and phased out those which have proved to be bad investments. Some marketing dollars are a wash or just a cost of doing business in my opinion, and that's okay with me as long as I'm making that choice consciously. And our weekly action plan number five, know your market, go see some property. Full disclosure, I can be a bit judgy. For the longest time, I've had that opinion that the only agents who go to broker opens are the ones who need the free lunch being served. Nasty, right? Well, the truth is my clients are counting on me to have seen the inventory currently on the market. And in the luxury segment, the best way to see new offerings is to attend broker opens and preview property. It's fun for social media too. It's also a great way to support your colleagues and maintain positive relationships with other agents in the marketplace. You have no idea how important those relationships are until you're in the middle of a very difficult transaction and you get the benefit of the doubt or some latitude from your counterpart. Although I'm very collaborative and cooperative with other agents, broker opens are still, they're just not my favorite, but they are important. After studying the very top luxury agents in my market and across the country, they're simply part of the mix. So they remain on my weekly checklist to make sure that I go. Now let's talk about the ideal day. I schedule my daily and weekly actions using time blocking in week increments. I schedule myself in time blocks per week with every day being slightly different. So Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I have a standing meeting with my marketing manager. Thursdays, I have standing meetings with my team agents. Sunday, I shoot my YouTube series, Tuesday tours. And my weekly schedule includes all of my non-negotiable daily activities and the items on my weekly action checklist. When I first endeavored to time block, I made a lot of mistakes. And I was convinced that time blocking, it was just never going to work for me. There was just too much to do. I started by adding my entire to-do list into the calendar in 15-minute increments, layering in prospecting meetings and time for appointments. But what I had missed was time to process email and tasks, time for inbound calls and interruptions, updating my database, reviewing hot sheets, breaks of any kind, anything social, <laughs> and client updates. Needless to say, it did not go well. What I've discovered is that most things take far longer than I predict they will. A few things will take a bit less, and I should always leave earlier than I think it's going to take me to get somewhere. For me, time blocking works really well when I allow some margin for error. I build in some buffer, and when I'm a little ahead of schedule, I can slide something in that arises unexpectedly. I use the G Suite calendar, and I drag around my events to the actual time that they happen. Then I can review the week after it's done and see where to make adjustments for next time. So my ideal day, it's going to be in the PDF that's attached, but I'll run through. My ideal day, 4.45, rise and shine. 5 o'clock is the 5 a.m. call. 5.15, I scan email and text social for overnight activity. I know they say don't check your email first thing in the morning. Haven't been able to break that habit. 
5.30 a.m. my morning routine kicks off. By 8 a.m. I'm at my desk reviewing the day ahead, hitting anything that's really pressing. 8.30 I review my hot sheets. 9 o'clock phone prospecting hot list. 10 o'clock warm list. 11 a.m. email. I build a little buffer in there middle of the day. That way if I'm running behind, I can always eat at my desk. 1 p.m. is a project or more prospecting. 2 to 5 are appointments. At 5 p.m., I return my calls and emails. 5.30, I review the day, and I plan tomorrow. And at 6 p.m., if all has gone to plan, I'm either taking a golf lesson or reading a book. 9 p.m., lights out. So, in conclusion, I'll share that by managing myself using daily and weekly action checklists and time blocking to execute, I am finally on track to earn $1 million in GCI for the very first time. I've had this as my singular goal for the past three years and somehow never quite got there. Why? Well, I was taking a lot of action and a lot of it was misguided and not productive toward this goal. When I got serious about studying those who were executing on the very thing I wanted to do myself and I modeled my daily activities after them, this is when that $1 million in GCI became an actual predictable outcome. A day in the life of a top luxury agent is about modeling. First, you choose what kind of business and life you want to live. Then you figure out who has successfully done this. And then you model your daily actions after theirs. I have made a quantum leap in my results by studying the habits and rituals of people who have already accomplished the things I aspire to do. And now, my dear friends, so can you. Thank you, Rochelle. That was simply amazing. For those of you watching, I don't know how many pages of notes you took. But I got like three pages of outstanding notes with just absolutely amazing content. I got to ask you one question before we leave. Yes. How long did it take you to produce such an amazing presentation? You know, the outline was actually fairly straightforward. I knew which things were going to be most effective for me that, you know, I had really grown in the past few years. And then I just sort of fleshed it out with a few stories that I thought were entertaining. That was actually the easy part. You know, and that's a testament to your business because as you were presenting, I just want to point out, you can tell you live and die by the sword. You actually implement these tools, these tactics, these strategies every day. And it really came through in your presentation. And we are so thankful to have someone like you in our ecosystem to share that kind of information with our audience. So one question to the audience, what's your next step in your luxury adventure? Thank you so much for being here. We're going to stick around for a little Q&A and uh, open the chat up. So I hope some others will participate. Again, thank you so much for being here. Simply amazing. Absolutely. My pleasure. My friends, please don't be shy. Put some things over there in that chat window. That's what it's for. Absolutely. My privilege to be here. And I'd love to connect with all of you one-on-one. -on -one. Bye, everybody. Thank you.